Good morning and welcome to Phoenix Fellowship Live. We're so glad you joined us. I'm Pastor Daryl Chilson and my dear wife Sammy is at the controls. Thank you so much for your help this morning, love. This morning's study is of particular interest to us because it makes evident to us our own roots in Christ and the blessings we are promised as a part of Israel. Thanks again for joining us. I'd like to begin with prayer. Father in heaven, on this beautiful day that you've given us to study your word and to gather together from all over the United States and perhaps even outside. Your church is gathered in your name and we pray that your spirit will be present among us to give us a clear understanding of your word and its import to our lives. Thank you so much, O oh Lord, for your grace and for your word which tells us of it. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Our theme text this morning is found in Romans chapter nine, beginning with verse one, and I'd like to read that to you as you read it on the screen. I tell you the truth in Christ, Paul says, I am not lying my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit, that I have great sorrow and continue grief in my heart, or I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Why would Paul say something that strong? In Romans chapter 1 through chapter 8, we have just read, when we come to verse 1 of chapter 9, we have just read in depth the most concise explanation, the most concise discourse on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul has put so much into this discourse, this treatise, if you please. And it is a marvelous treatise. It is the one place in scripture where you can find a true account of what Jesus did for you. And Paul has just spent eight chapters doing that. And then it's like he sets his pen down. And in chapter nine, he starts thinking out loud, perhaps, or on paper, of course. He starts thinking about all the people in his life who have been a part of his life for years, who don't know this story. They don't appreciate this story. They have, in fact, rejected this story. And Paul's heart is broken because of their rejection of the story of Christ and his saving grace. It's I don't know if I could feel exactly the way he does, but he says, I wish that I were myself accursed um, from Christ for my brethren, if that would do any good in saving them through this message. So let's go on to verse th uh, four. I, I, just, I just have to say, this is such a revelation of Paul's heart and how much he loved Israel, how much a part of Israel he was, and how much he wanted Israel to hear the word of truth, the gospel of their salvation. So in, in, chapter, in, in Romans 9 and beginning with verse 4, he starts talking about Israel. And he says, who are these Israelites? They are the ones to whom pertain the adoption. They are the ones to whom pertain the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promises, of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. What a heritage the Israelites had. They had deep roots into the life and the love of God. And they had for centuries, way back to Abraham, when Abraham was promised that 
his seed would be as the sand of the sea and the stars of the heavens. What a heritage. And now, as we look at this passage of what Israel had, the heritage from God, the adoption, Paul says first, the adoption. If you go back to Exodus chapter 4, which we're not going to do this morning, I'll just tell you this story. The very last plague on Egypt that God sent so that Pharaoh would let God's people go was the plague of the death of the firstborn. And just before that plague came, God told Moses to go to Pharaoh and say to him, Israel is my firstborn. Let Israel go or I will take your firstborn. And that's exactly what happened. God here is claiming this people, the Israelite nation, he is claiming this people as his firstborn, as part of his very own loins, as it were. And then the glory that is mentioned here, the glory. When you think back about the glory of God's presence in the sanctuary, the glory of the temple that was built there in Jerusalem, the beauty of it. And even before that, Solomon's temple, which was even more beautiful. The glory of God's presence was in the sanctuary. And in the wilderness tabernacle, there was the Shekinah glory, which means it is the dwelling or the settling presence of God. The priests could, even, could not even go into that compartment of the sanctuary or the, yes, the tabernacle, except for once a year. And then after much heart searching, after much incense, after much prayer, representing the people, that's where God's glory dwelt. And Israel had this as a heritage. And then the covenants that had been passed down from Abraham, three times God came to Abraham first in Genesis 12, then in Genesis 15, and then in Genesis 17, three times God came and made a covenant with Abraham that his seed would be as the sands of the sea. And then how about the giving of the law? Moses, what a story that is with Moses going up on the mountain and having actual conversation with God. Presence, his presence was there. He talked to him. It was thunder and lightning, and it was just an amazing encounter with God that Moses had, and God gave him the Ten Commandment law, as well as some other laws that he wanted him to pass on to Israel. They have this in their heritage, the Israelites. This is part of the Israelite heritage that Paul is talking about when he's saying, these roots are so deep into the heart of God. And I wish these people, these, this nation could experience the beauty of the gospel story and what Jesus Christ has done for them. The service of God in the sanctuary. The sanctuary services were so meticulous and so defined and you had in the sanctuary the, the golden candlesticks and, and all of the furniture of the, of the holy place. How about the promise of the Savior all the way back to Adam? But from Abraham on, they had the promise of the Savior. You look in the Old Testament, it is there everywhere. Prophecies about Jesus coming. And then in Deuteronomy in chapter 10, and I, th I think I'm going to read that to you. Deuteronomy 10 and verses 12 to 15. The love of God for the fathers. What a beautiful picture. Verses 12 through 15 of Deuteronomy 10. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, to keep his commandments and his statutes. I command you today for your good. 
Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth and all that is in it. And the Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them. He chose their descendants after them. You above all peoples, as it is this day. That was Israel. That was one of the beautiful things that had passed down from child, from father to child to grandchild, down through their history. What a rich heritage Israel had and has. And then the crowning piece of glory for this nation out of Israel would come the Savior of the world. Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham, was born of Israel. What a heritage. And then uh, we notice, you know, in John's, in John's um, gospel, in, in John chapter 8, we read about how Jesus is talking about uh, if you if if the Son shall set you free, you will be free indeed. You remember that passage, how Jesus is talking to the Pharisees about the freedom that they will have in the Son, and their response was, "We have never been in bondage. Abraham is our father." Well, they knew their heritage, but they didn't value it. When the seed of Abraham came, they rejected him. As a nation, they disdained God's gift to them and put him on a cross. That's what was breaking Paul's heart right after he had completed this discourse on the gospel. It broke his heart so much did he wish that Israel could see what they had and now in Christ all the more. The Jews had a heritage to be treasured. Israel was like a tree of strength nurtured for centuries by the heavenly horticulturalist. You know what a horticulturalist is, right? Someone who gardens, someone who, who uh, cultivates orchards and vineyards and plants. They had been nurtured by the heavenly horticulturalist, Jesus Christ, God himself. And they had a great tree, which is likened to an olive tree in Scripture, and in, particularly in Paul's chapters here, in chapters 9 through 11 of Romans, he, they are likened to an olive tree. But their fruit was just a show. And so we find Jesus at the end of his ministry on earth, beginning after all these years of months of teaching and pleading with Israel and trying to show them that he had come for them. We find him in the following verses, we find him beginning to let go of Israel. For Israel had rejected their Savior. Israel was turning their back on the greatest of heritage, the Savior himself. Notice in Luke chapter 19, and uh, if you have your Bibles, it's a good thing. We're not going to put all these texts up on the screen. If you have your Bibles, it would be good for you to look some of these texts up with me. In chapter 19 of Luke, we read in verse 41, this text tells what Jesus had to say and how he was feeling that Sunday morning as he rode into Jerusalem on the colt just before his death. This is Passion Week again. We're making reference to Passion Week. It was Sunday morning, Jesus is coming in to Jerusalem. And in verse 41, it says, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. 
He wept over it. His heart was breaking like Paul's was breaking in Romans 9. His heart was breaking and he said to those Israelites, to the city that he was approaching, the people of, that lived in that city, to the nation of Israel, he said, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. They will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. You didn't recognize the one whom God had sent to save you, to live for you, to die for you, to be your savior. Jesus is beginning, beginning to separate himself from Israel in this verse. He's done everything he can to bring Israel to him, to woo them to him. And they have rejected him. The next morning, it says in Matthew 21, the next morning, as Jesus was coming back to the city after he had spent the night in Bethany, in Matthew 21 and verses 18 and 19, it says, now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered away. I can't help but believe that this was a tree that represented Israel to Jesus. There was no fruit on their tree. There was only the show of leaves. Show, just show. No fruit, just show. And in the 23rd chapter of Matthew, I'm just going to read the first seven of this chapter, but the entire chapter are Christ's last words to the leaders of Israel. It says, He's actually talking to the multitudes too, but you listen to the passage. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. All their works they do are to be seen by men, show, leaves on a tree, but no fruit. They make their philosophies broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at the feasts, the best seats in the synagogue greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. And as you go through the chapter, he talks about how they spend a great deal of show, making sure that the tomb stones of the prophets are whitened and clean and beautiful, but they themselves are like those tombs beautiful on the outside, nothing but dead bones on the inside. And then another verse in this chapter says, you go from land to sea, across the country, all over you go to get one proselyte for your faith. And then you make them a greater person of hell than they were before. This was what Israel was doing, and Jesus is separating himself from Israel 
before he is crucified. Finally, in chapter 23 of Matthew, verses 39, 37 to 39, we have that very similar statement that we read in Luke 19, where Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem. He says, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, until you see me coming in the clouds of heaven. As a nation, Israel rejected the ultimate gift of God, Jesus Christ his son. And God, listen to me, God rejected Israel as a nation. That's right. God rejected Israel as a nation, as a nation of his people. In fact, in Romans chapter 11, where we were looking before, in Romans chapter 11, verse 20, Paul says, because of unbelief, they were broken off. Because of unbelief. So, who does Paul say are the beneficiaries of Israel's rejection by God as a nation? Did God make something good out of this horrible, this horrible, experience of cutting off the nation of Israel from the blessings that he had promised. Is there, is there something good that came out of it? Are there any beneficiaries that come as a result of God's rejection of Israel as a nation? Yes, yes, and this is not the end of the story. Yes, the rest of the world are the beneficiaries, the Gentiles, us. God has grafted us into his family tree. That slide that you see, a stump, is like the tree of Israel that has grown and grown and had deep roots, as olive trees did, by the way. Deep roots in their heritage. They were the, the, the cradle out of which our Savior was born, out of that nation and all of its culture and all of its um, blessings, all of its history. Our Savior was born out of that nation, that nation which was a mighty tree and was cut off. But notice, in this slide, there's the beginning of a grafting process going on. Who is being grafted into this tree? You and I, the Gentile world, those, well, we're gonna talk about that in just a second. On this stump, you see a graft that slips right into the bark of that tree that had been cut off. You see a graft and it will grow another, another mighty tree, another mighty branch out of that stump. Turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 11. This is where Paul begins to bring good out of all of the bad that he has, he has told us about Israel about their rejection, about their rejection of Christ and his rejection of them. This is where we begin to see a new picture developing and one that is very beautiful and comforting. Paul says in Romans 11, beginning with verse 15, for if they're being cast away, and don't, 
don't make that too soft. I mean, they were cut off. The nation of Israel, not the individuals, but the nation was cut off. If their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Is there no hope for Israel anymore? Not as a nation. As a nation, it is cut off. But individuals, people who come from Israel, who have that heritage, who have those roots into the very culture that has given us roots in our Christian faith. What would we do without the prophets? What would we do without the Old Testament? without the writings of Moses, without the story of Abraham, what would we do? We would have nothing to reference in regard to our relationship and saving experience with Jesus Christ. Israel has given us the stump, and we as a graft in that stump benefit from the life of the roots. And all of that that was given to them that they threw away for pride's sake. For pride's sake. They became proud and rejected the gift of God. So Paul says, what will be their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, what a blessing it is to you. So this process of grafting is illustrated in a video that I want to show you right now. And so I'm going to ask for this video to be put on the screen. And I want you to watch and I will comment. I will comment as we watch it together. What you see here is a young man who is taking an olive tree and he is grafting in a branch cutting away branches that are in the way. And then he takes a knife and he, he makes a cut in the bark of the tree. And he creates like a little pocket in the side of the tree. And into that pocket, he slips a branch from another tree. Now watch how he carefully wraps that up he wraps it up so that nothing from the outside will get in, no disease, no, no bugs, nothing will hinder that little branch from gradually taking root into the, the branch of that tree or the stalk of that tree. This is what God has done for us. He has grafted us in to the original stock of Israel. And we now receive the blessings that were theirs, and they with us as they accept Christ. I want to come to just a few conclusions here. Toward the end of our study this morning, I want to look at some conclusions, some things that we need to remember in this process because there may be somebody that thinks who's hearing me that are, thinks that it's too too strong to say that Israel as a nation was cut off but that's what the scripture says let's look back to the gospel let's look back to the foundation principles of our faith remember we have talked about this before there are five principles that are foundations of our faith as Christians. 
The first is that the Bible is our only source of faith and practice. Jesus, number two, Jesus is the only one who can give us salvation. Sola Scriptura, sola Christ, only Jesus. And how do we receive salvation through him? Only by grace and only through faith. Let me ask you a question. How is Israel saved? How are people of that nation saved? By their heritage or by their faith in Jesus Christ? Who was it that came to them out of all of this ritual of the sanctuary service? My goodness, it seems as if they would have grabbed hold of the imagery and the promises that were theirs from the prophets in the Old Testament. It's John who stood on the shores of the Jordan River and cried out as he saw Jesus coming his way, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So how is Israel saved? by the Lamb of God, not by their heritage, by the Lamb of God. They can't say, we have Abraham as our father. They are saved by the Lamb of God, by faith in him. What about Abraham in Romans chapter four? It talks about Abraham in chapter four. And I'm reading there, beginning with verse one. What shall we say then about Abraham our father, what he has found according to the flesh. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham, the father of Israel, believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted grace, but of debt. How is Israel saved today? How? How are they saved? By grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. Are there individuals that can be saved from this cut off tree, this stump? Yes. Are there Israelites, are there Jews today who can be saved through Christ? Yes. They can join us in the graft. They can join us. They are actually, they are actually double blessed because they have the heritage and now they have Christ. How are the Gentiles saved? By grace, through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Let me close with this text that comes to us from Galatians chapter 3, and this kind of pulls it together. Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse 26. Hear it as a verse, as the voice of God to you this morning. Regardless of your heritage, this verse is for you. God says through Paul, you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. There is no other way. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And get this, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Oh, for Israel to hear these verses and embrace them. They are Abraham's seed by blood 
We are Abraham's seed by faith in Jesus Christ. Together, all of us can be Christ's through faith, by grace, through faith, in him alone. There is no need for one single Israelite to perish just because they were cut off as a nation. Every individual has opportunity to be grafted back in to the stock that is natural to their own heritage and to their own blood, their own ancestry. So today I invite Jews and Greeks, Jews and Gentiles, Christians and non-Christians, the way is the same for all of us by being grafted in to Christ. If we are Christ's, then we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, this morning, as we consider these things, I pray that you will help us to see with your eyes the heritage that is ours through the nation of Israel, the root system of faith that is ours, from whom came our Savior, and from whom comes all the blessings promised to Israel throughout the centuries, the Old Testament. I pray today that every person in the hearing of my voice may turn to you and embrace you by faith and through your grace be saved in the kingdom of God. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.